again. Anyways, yeah. Hey, uh, what I want to do first is I want to, I'm going to read God's word. And so I would like for everybody to please stand. I slipped in the word please because I know some of you don't like being told what to do. Um, so I'm asking. We do this from time to time just to, just to elevate the importance of God's word. And so this passage that I'm going to read from um, is a phenomenal story. And this is what I'm going to be talking about today. So if you have a Bible, we're in Mark chapter 2. Um, or you could just listen if you want. Here's what it says in Mark, Mark 2, verse 1. I'm still trying to catch my breath. Here we go. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no, room, no, no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowds, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can, only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to sta- or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? He goes, So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. I know some of you live your lives like, don't tell me what to do. So it's a big thing for you to be able to do that. Um, But uh, so today is our big, it's our grand opening. And if you've never been here before, you don't know anything about us. Uh, I just want to say welcome. If, if you're looking for a church in, in this community, we would love for you to consider us. We are a church family. And um, basically how we arrived at today is uh, Grace Church started a little over seven years ago up on the square. And about four years ago, we began talks with some of the people here at Calvary Baptist Church about, because we never had a permanent location. And so we began talks with Pastor Chuck that was here, Chuck Wheeler, and and uh, about what it would look like for us to merge our two churches. In the last several years, the Calvary Baptist Church had been struggling a little bit to, to grow. And so we really believe the leadership here have been amazing to work with, but we the leadership at Calvary, then the leadership at Grace Church got together and prayed, and we believe that God brought us together. And so we do believe it was a God thing. But we also, one of the reasons that we did it, one of the main reasons we did it is because we believe that we can do more in this community together than we can apart. And, and we just, we really believe that. And so today is also friend day. Does it, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out the sound. When I stand right here, it sounds like I'm in a tunnel, but over here sounds good. So I'll just stand over here. Uh, we're still trying to work out all the kinks with the sound and everything. But um, so today is friend day. And if, if you were invited by a friend, someone that goes to Grace Church and they invited you, they've been pestering you for a long time about coming to church and you came today, we want to just tell you that the reason we invited you here today is because we want your money. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, people think that though. People, people, I've invited people to church before. Like, oh, preachers just want my money. Churches are just out. All they talk about is money. And I, I promise you, if you're a guest with us today, we're, we're not asking you for anything. In fact, we already took the offering, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we didn't invite you for that. We, we wanted you to come and kind of get an experience. We want you to have a positive experience at our church, and we want you to come back. We want you to get involved and join with our church family because this is a great place. So in your notes, I do have two things that I wanted to say to our guests today. Just to start off, this is in your notes. The first thing that we want to say to our friends is that we, we love our church. I mean, Grace Church, the, the people that go here, they love it. We're more like a church family than anything, and certainly not perfect. We have the crazy uncles you know, you, you probably are one of them, but, uh, 
we, we have all of that. We have baggage. Um, but Grace Church is a little bit different if, you're, um, if you've been to some other churches. Because I've talked to people all the time, and they, you know, I invite them, and they, they had a terrible experience at another church, and so they won't come here and even try us out. And it's not that, that we're better than anyone else, but we are a little bit different. And the main reason is since the very inception of our church, we have lived by the motto that says, no perfect people allowed. And I want to explain to you what that means because some people get that and some people don't. And uh, some, some people, and again, I, I'm not downing other churches or other Christians, but I've been to some other churches before where it, it feels like, like you have to dress up to go there and, and you have to put on a facade and you certainly don't let your hair down and you, don't, you, don't, you, you can't be vulnerable with them. I mean, there's something about Christianity, something about Christians where we don't like revealing our secrets to other people. And I, and I get it, but... But at our church, we, Grace Church admits that every person in here is flawed. Every person in here has a past, and we all carry baggage with us, including the, the pastor of this church has been to prison. I don't know if you know that or not. He got saved in prison. That was me uh, back in 1997. I didn't go to church, and I went to prison for selling drugs. In fact, uh, Kevin, Ka- Kevin Cowens lived across the street. At, his mom still lives there. But I just want to tell you guys, like he, I used to get my drugs from his house across the street. I did. He was my supplier, and, uh, and I, I was selling for him. I went to prison, and I, was just, I told God, I said, I don't want to live like this anymore. And I got saved, and Kevin ended up going to federal prison, and he got saved and too, and now his family goes to our church. God's got a, a real sense of humor about how he does stuff. But, uh, but I just say all that to say, listen, this is a safe place. You don't have to pretend that you have it all together because nobody does. And, and at our church, we focus on that. We, we want to reiterate to you that, hey, we know you have baggage, and it's okay. God, God sees just who you are, and, and he loves you just the way that you are. And so that's one of the reasons why our church is different. The second thing is this, and, and this is in your notes, that we love Jesus. And, and I don't apologize for that. I, I know that sometimes people who don't go to church kind of look at church people as weird and because they are. Uh, religious people can be a little weird. You might be freaked out. Um, in fact, I have, I debated all week whether or not I was going to show this video, but I'm going to do it. I showed it in the first service. I didn't hear too many complaints, but this is a, this, this is a guy, he's a Christian comedian. His name is Michael Jr. And he's got some funny things to say about what I just talked about. Cause sometimes church people can be a little like, like you ever met some, don't, don't point at anybody. But if you ever met a church person and they're just sort of socially awkward, like I, I run into people like that all the time. You can't have a normal conversation without them Jesus juking you. You ever had someone Jesus juke you that, where, where you're just talking about a regular conversation and they want to, I, I don't know. It's, anyways, it's a funny thing. So we're going to watch this just for, I just, I just want. I didn't want to be a Christian either for a long time because some Christians are creepy. There's some creepy Christians. It's creepy everything. It's creepy Muslims, but some Christians is creepy. You ever had somebody, they talk about God and they voice change all of a sudden? Like, yo, man, how you doing? I'm cool. Can I tell you about the Lord? What is wrong with your voice? (laughs) What's wrong with your voice? (laughs) Where somebody start praying in the middle of your conversation? You was just having a conversation. Yo, you see the game? That was a good game. Man, that game was a good God. We just thank you for being so holy, Lord. You're so awesome. I'm like, are we praying right now? You are creepy. Before I became a Christian, I, used to, I would ask a girl out, and this, this one girl, I remember, she said to me, she said, I'm dating Jesus. I didn't know what that meant. Now I realize she was just saying she wanted to get closer to God before she started dating. Back then, I had no idea. I thought she was dating Jesus. <laughs> a month later, she called me up and said, you still want to go out? I'm like, did you break up with Jesus? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know for sure, but I think it was your fault. Whatever happened, <laughs> it was your Now you're coming to me? You are confused. You better go back, I'm telling you. He forgives you for everything and you get free wine? You better call him. You better go call him. Because what if I'm the jealous type, right? I walk in the room, she praying. I'm like, who you talking to? Because you got different types of Christians. This is what I found out. You got Christians who are cool. You can hang around with them. Iron sharp and iron relationships, right? Then you got Christians who may have a little limp in their walk. They got the hat on, but the shoes don't match. (laughs) 
Then you got Christians who, I'm just going to put this out there. You ever know somebody that was oversaved? <laughs> don't look at them. Don't look at them. <laughs> you can't even have a regular conversation with them. He's like, hey, man, I'm thirsty. You thirsty? Thirsty for the Lord. <laughs> thirsty for the Lord? Hey, I lost my keys. Could you help me find my keys? You need the keys to the kingdom. I'm like, yeah, I didn't drive a kingdom. I drove a Toyota. I know as soon as I said oversaved, some of y'all had somebody in mind, but if you didn't, somebody had you in mind. You could be oversaved. You ain't know it. Now I got to let you know that you oversaved. A couple indicators to let you know you oversaved. Just a couple indicators. Um, if you don't mess around with computers because it got a cursor, I'm sorry. If you rebuke vacuum cleaners, because it's a dirt devil. <laughs> I got an aunt that's oversaved. She messes up television shows for us. We're watching Extreme Makeover Home Edition. At the beginning of the show, they always tell you the sad story about the people. My aunt going to start praying for them. Lord, help them get a new house, Lord. Just... <laughs> They're going to get a new house. They're going to get a new house. She's like, yes, you got to believe. I'm like, no, you got to have cable is what you got to do. The point about that is, that I guess the lesson of the story is, don't be, a, don't be a creepy Christian. You know what I mean? Like, just don't be that guy or that girl. All right. So I want to, I just want to say this before we get to the story, and is that Jesus is my best friend. And I know it sounds like a cliche, but Jesus, Jesus is the only one who really knows me. Like out of everyone in the world, he loves me unconditionally and he loves you unconditionally. And I want you to think about this. He knows everything you ever did. He knows where you were at at two o'clock last night. Some of you were at party, but he knows, he knows everything about you. He knows every thought that you think your whole life. He knows every thought that's entered into your head and the things you've entertained. And, and I promise you, if your husband knew what you were thinking all the time, they wouldn't love you anymore. And if your wife knew the thoughts that come into your head, she would divorce you immediately. That's just the way the world works. It's, it's the way it is. If you knew the real me, you probably wouldn't love me that much. But God does. God knows you and he knows me. He knows the intimate thoughts that I have. And he still loves me. Before the foundation of the world, he knew I was going to be here. He knew all the stuff I was going to struggle with. And he still sent his son to die for me on the cross and for you too. That's how much he loves you. That's why he's my best friend. I hope he's your best friend. So let's get into this, um, Mark chapter 2. We're going to go back to that story that I read at the beginning, and we're going to go through it verse by verse. And uh, here's where it says, uh, you can follow along. Verse 1 says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. So let's thought about that. It, it's a crazy, just understand the context. This was 2000 years ago. They didn't have a big church auditorium like this. So wherever Jesus went, there were just large crowds of people because he had something to say, like he was claiming to be God. So people wanted to lean in and go, I want to hear what this dude has to say. And then not only that, not only did he say he was God, but he would turn around and he would feed people like like 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves. And he would do miracles. He would bring people back from the dead. He was doing that to prove that he was God. So people gravitated to him and they wanted to hear what he had to say. And so he got to this house. I don't know whose house it was and I don't know how big the house it was, but he got there and he went in and he's preaching and there's a whole bunch of, the, the, the house is just packed with people and there's a line of people outside and it says that there was so much room that even outside there wasn't room, okay? Now, ver the, the next verse at the end of verse two, it says, while he is preaching God's word, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They, they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So Jesus is in the house and they, they come, they brought their friend. We'll just call him Bob. I don't know what his name was. Uh, that's not really a Jewish name, but we'll call him Bob. And so Bob had been paralyzed and he had to lay on a mat. He couldn't walk. He, he just he was crippled. And, and I don't know how long he had been like that, but he had four friends that were like, and you got to read between the lines, but his four friends were like, there's a dude named Jesus and he's going around healing people. 
and he's at this house and he's preaching right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our friend, four of us, we're going to we're going to swoop them up and we're going to take them to Jesus. And I promise you, they didn't know much about Jesus. They didn't, they, the four friends may not even have believed that he was the son of God. You don't have to understand everything, but they knew, they, they knew that people were being healed by this guy. So they brought their friend to Jesus. And that was an amazing thing. And, it, and I want you to look at, it says, it says, so they, and then they couldn't get in. So they got to the front of the house. They saw the line. They were trying to get in and no way they get in. So they, um, It says, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. The only picture in my mind that I can imagine is is Spider-Man when he goes down like this and he's looking face to face. You know what I mean? Like that's what they did. They just lowered him down. And this guy, paralyzed man, he's on his mat and he's just staring at Jesus, right? And, um, And so I just love the perseverance of that. Let me talk about that for a second. Let me talk about perseverance because life is all about perseverance. I know too many people, I know too many Christians that when they, when, when, when they come to an obstacle in life or an obstruction, they just go, eh, you know, must not meant to be meant to be. And they walk away. But I know too many people in life that when you come to an obstacle, you just kind of throw up your hands and you, and you give up. And the Bible tells us to never ever give up. You, you know where I, I see that at? This is just a personal story. I see it at Walmart. And if you work at Walmart or Home Depot, I see it at Home Depot. I see it at Lowe's and Menards. And um, nothing against the people, but, but sometimes I'll go there. And I, like, like I go there because the week before or two weeks before, I was there and I've been price checking, you know, and I found that at, at Home Depot, they got the, the best price there. So I go there and I'm like, hey, do you have any of these boards or something? It could be anything. I've had, I've, I've had this conversation dozens of times. And I say, hey, do you guys have this? And the employee will turn to me and go, no, we don't carry that here. And I'm like, and I want to grab them and choke them because I'm like, I know you do because I was here last week and you had it. And I was just on your website. And I know I just need you to tell me which aisle it's in, you know. And, and they're convinced that you don't have it. And I've done this several times. And, and I hopefully kept my Christian witness as I did it. But I've had people at Walmart tell me, we don't, we don't, we don't have that here. And I go and find it because I, I just don't accept that. If you tell me, you know, and I've seen it before, I'm not going home until I find it. I will tear the place apart. And I've gone and found what I was looking for. And I go back to that employee and say, I just tap him on the shoulder. I just want to tell you, you guys do have this because if anybody else comes looking for that, now you know where to send them to. And that drives me nuts. It drives me nuts, the, the lack of perseverance in people's lives. Your whole life's going to be about, about that. You're always going to have obstacles in your life. And if you give up too soon, um, you're going to miss out on the blessing. There are, people, there are people here, there are people that I know that have been told by the doctors there's no hope. You know what I mean? There's people walking around. In fact, there's a new song by Mercy Me on the radio. And it's about that. It's a story about a guy who was in the hospital. And I don't know what disease he had, but, but he was dying. And they told his wife, they said, you need to go in and say your last goodbyes. And she said, I don't accept that. She goes, you don't know. You're not God. And she prayed him out of that hospital room. And he's walking. He's a walking miracle today. And there are people that, there are people in this, in this room who have prayed people out of hospital rooms. I promise you. And then there are other people that have probably died because someone just said, eh, Doctor said there's no hope. But I don't accept that. You understand what I'm saying? Like, like they're not God. When God says it's over, it's over. And you need to persevere in your life. No matter if it's a if it's a health problem, if it's a struggle, if it's in your marriage, just with your kids, your kids are acting crazy. Don't just accept that. Just just go, I don't accept that. I'm gonna pray for them. You have the most powerful thing in the world, and that's praying to God. And you can do more than just throw your hands up and say, I don't I don't accept that. People who live like that, people who have that tenaciousness, that perseverance, they see miracles. And the people who have no faith, they sit and complain about the people that see miracles. And they're like, I wish God would do that for me. I'm like, he, it, it has nothing to do with us. I don't have the power to heal anybody, but God does. So don't ever give up. Just be like that. And I, I love it. I see that with these guys because these guys could have very easily brought their friend to Jesus and said, eh, we can't get in. Sorry, Bob. Maybe next time and take Bob back home. They didn't do that. They were like, I'll figure out a way. I'll get on the, the dang roof if I have to, and I'll rip, I'll rip a hole in the roof and get my friend to Jesus if that's what I have to do. 
You understand what I'm saying? Like these guys did that for their friends because they loved him that much. And so the question for us is how good of friends are we? Do you have that good of friends? Do you have friends that would do that for you? Would you do that for your friends? Or would you be like, hey, Bob, sorry, just wasn't, wasn't meant to be today. Let's go on. Verse five says, I, w- I want you to catch this because these are very important details. He says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my, my child, your sins are forgiven. Now, what did he say? Did Jesus, did, does it say that Jesus saw Bob's faith and was like, bro, you, you got a lot of faith coming here. No, he saw the faith of his friend. Literally, Bob got healed because of his four friends had enough faith. Because when I, when I was just talking about perseverance a minute ago, Jesus calls that faith. You understand what I'm saying? Like I was, I was referring to it as perseverance, but Jesus looks at that and says, you have faith. The four friends had faith enough to say, I, I will figure out a way to get my friends. And Jesus always, I'm telling you, God always sees perseverance and he always blesses it. He always blesses it. And he looked, he says, he sees the faith of his friends and he healed him. And then, and then, um, it says, it says, see in their faith, Jesus healed the paralyzed man. My, my child, your sins are forgiven. Now, I want to talk about this for a second because I bet the guy was a little confused. Here he is. They lowered him down like Spider-Man, and he's face to face with Jesus. And Jesus looks at him, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And the guy's like, that's great, but I need to walk. You know what I mean? Like, I thought I was going to get to walk again. And I want you to understand, this is a principle with God. God always gives you what you need, not necessarily what you want. He doesn't give you what you think you need. He gives you what you really need because he knows what you really, sometimes you pray about something and God's like, no, 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 you don't need that. Here's what you really need. And so you have, to have, you have to have enough faith to continue and persevere with those prayers. And what I like to say, I like to look at it as when I'm praying about something, when I need God to answer me, I'm, I'm like trying lock doors and I'm like, Lord, if this is it, open the door. Now in my past, and I probably still struggle with this, I've tried to pry doors open that God has closed and I always regret that. And so do you. But what I try to do is I always just say, God, if this is your will, if this is what you want from me, or if it's not what you want from me, close the door and I'll walk away. And I don't care if it's, it, it, it could be any number of things, buying a vehicle, buying a house, changing jobs, whatever, whatever you're going through and you need to know God's will, just say, God, if it's not that, close the door and I'll, and I'll walk away. But it might just be that God's testing your faith and he just wants you to persevere. Okay, so these guys were, com- or he was, he might've been a little confused because he came there to get a miracle so he could walk and Jesus forgave him of his sins and gave him a home in heaven, gave him what he, what he really need, needed. And that's what God does with us too. So let, let's go on. Verse six, it says, but some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And, and they're accurate about that. That's true. Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus was trying to prove to them that he was God. And it's so amazing to me when you read through the Bible, the, the New Testament, whenever, wherever Jesus went, Remember I said earlier, he always had crowds of people following him, but he also had a crowd of Pharisees. These were like pastors that were, you know, they they felt threatened by Jesus. And so Jesus would always have a crowd of people that he's talking to. And out in the back are all these these naysayers, all these, always these people who just didn't like what he was doing. You're like, oh yeah, he healed, he brought this guy back from the dead, but he did it on a Sunday. We don't like that. And Jesus is like, i I'm the creator of the universe. I can do whatever I want on whatever day I want. You know, that's how he lived his life. And they were so fixated on the details. They were legalists. And and I'm telling you, there are religious people, there are Christians still get so, you know, bogged down in the minutia of the details of life that they keep people from coming to Jesus all the time. And we got to not do that. We got to just let the Holy Spirit work. Okay, let's go on. Let me finish the story. Verse eight says, Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question in your heart, question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, take up your, uh, uh, pick up your mat and walk. So I will prove to you that the son of man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. Now, what I want you to see in this, I want you to understand this is that 
it required an element of faith from this. Whenever Jesus would heal people, he always did it a little bit different. And I don't know why, because he could have just snapped his fingers. He could have just waved his hand. But he always did it just a little bit different. But almost always you find where it requires faith on their part. Jesus says, your, your sins are forgiven. He goes, stand up, take up your mat and walk. And I, know, I promise you, there's some people that I know that are laying there on this mat paralyzed for a long time. And they would say, bro, I can't stand up. I'm paralyzed. And Jesus, Jesus going, stand up, take up your mat and go home. And they would just sit there instead of just doing what he says. I, I promise you, there are times in your life. In fact, let me say it this way. Every time you pray about something with God and it's a miracle, you are not going to understand that. God is going to go, okay, here's what I want you to do. And you're, I promise you, you're going to take a step back and go, nah, that's not what I should do. But if you understood the mind of God, then you, you'd be better than every person on planet earth. I don't understand why God does what he does. But when I pray and I say, God, I, don't, I want your will to be done. And God says, here's what I want you to do. It's not going to make sense to me, but I trust him. So if you just would do it, I promise you it will work out. That's how, that's how it works out with God. So this guy had to have faith. He stood up. It says, he says, and the man, he jumped up. What would you do? You've been in a mat for a long time, unable to walk. Jesus goes, stand up. You'd jump up too. You'd do some jumping jacks or something. You'd be doing some kicks. You'd be, I don't know what you'd be doing. He says, it says the man jumped up. He grabbed his mat and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. So this guy had his life changed. Uh, I want to show you this video. This is, a, this is really just a kid's video, but I have a pretty simple mind, so I like to watch stuff like this to help. It's a visual of this story right here. So let's watch this. the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To wow, say, oh, man. Clearly, he hasn't read the Torah. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his home town. Well, we're right. Don't you complain. I mean, you're the one who kept stopping for lunch and morning tea and rest breaks and dessert joy and... <sighs> I'm sorry, man. I, I know this was important to you. Hang on! Levi, if you're afraid of heights, raise your hand. <laughs> what? Yay! Hey, V! Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do heal in the town, but we have heard What? Look! Hey, look out! When the sky was wet. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Forgiving sins? Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Get up, take your mat, and go home. Let me give you four things, and then we're because I know I can hear your stomachs growling. Some of you guys, you're getting hungry. And uh, by the way, as soon as we're done with this, we're going to go out on the ball field, and the food should should be ready. And uh, if it's not, then you can complain to them, not me. But uh, anyways, so four thoughts about true friendship. Because here's what, really quick, I just want you to understand this: like. 
the way God views friendship is different than the way that the world, like if you're not a church person, then you might have a different understanding of, of like biblical friendship, true friendship. But God looks at it and God has a different definition of love than the world does. He has a different definition than of friendship. So here in your notes, number one, the first thing is this, true friends do whatever it takes. Okay. And this goes back to what I was talking about being tenacious and being the, the perseverance. And so these four guys, they did whatever it took to get their friends to them. He was fortunate to have that. I was thinking about this and I was, I thought, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty blessed that I feel like I have at least four friends that if I was paralyzed on a mat and Jesus shows up, I feel like I've got at least four friends. I know, I know Jeff would organize a, a party to, to pick me up and get me that. I think so. Hopefully you have that because everybody needs some friends. That's what I want you to understand. You may not, I talked about this last week, how some people are like social butterflies you know, a lot, some people have a lot of friends, but you may just have one friend. If you have no friends, I promise you that's a problem. You need to have at least one good friend that you can bury your soul to, that you can, that, that can help hold you accountable. The, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. So we need people in our life. Okay. So the second thing is this, um, there's a difference between acquaintances and true friends, right? Everybody in here has got acquaintances. In fact, I've got like on my Facebook, I have almost 5,000 friends, and I'm, many of them I've never met. I mean, I've preached around the country at different churches and camps, and I'll have people add me on Facebook. I'm like, I don't know who you are, uh, but th- those are not my friends. Like, I don't have 5,000 friends. In fact, I was thinking about, you might get ticked off about this, but I was thinking, I'll bet you, I- I bet you my true friends, I could probably count on one hand, maybe two. Maybe I could have to take off a shoe or two, but I, I've, I'm just telling you, like, I, true friends. I'm talking about friends that will be there for you thick and thin, and they know who you are. You, you, you have bared your soul to them, and they've bared their soul to you. That's what a true friend is, someone who's got your back no matter what, all right? So you need to have a few of those, and you, you're not going to have many of those. I, I have another video. This is a guy. He's a Bible teacher. I've never even heard of him. I just found the video on, on YouTube. And he's got some great stuff to say about biblical friendship. I thought this was really interesting. Let's watch this. We tend to put all of our focus on romantic and sexual intimacy. And therefore, I think we've downplayed other forms of closeness, such as friendship. So we've turned friend from a noun into a verb. It's just you add someone on social media, hey presto, they're now your friend. Which just means if they have access to your homepage and you have access to theirs, that is friendship to many people in our world today. But in the Bible, if you, especially if you look at the book of Proverbs, a friend, is, a friend is someone who knows your soul. It's not just someone that you have a shared hobby with or occasionally hang out with. It's someone who knows the real you, who knows what's really going on inside. Um, the Hebrew word for friend is, is very closely related to the word for secret because a friend is someone you tell your secrets to. Uh, We see this actually with with what Jesus says in in John 15 verse 15. Jesus says to the disciples, I no longer call you servants for a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends because, and whatever Jesus says next is gonna show us what he thinks is defining a friendship. He says, I've called you friends because All that the Father has revealed to me, I have made known to you. In other words, Jesus is saying, you're friends because I'm letting you in on everything. I'm opening up to you. Um, I'm I'm spilling all the beans. So that I think is why in the Bible, friendship is such an honorable and precious thing. It is very intimate. Um, And Proverbs shows us you you can't be wise in God's world without friendship. that's a word not just to those of us who are, are single, it's a word to those of us who are married. I've seen marriages suffer and implode for a lack of friendship outside the marriage. All of us need friendship. Let me give you the last two things. Number three, the third thought that I have about true friendship is the, the essence of a church family is having true friendship. I, and I just want you to think about that. There, if, you're, if you don't have a church family, we would love for you to consider us and keep coming back and get involved and get into a life group. We, we want to help you grow. 
And you need that, and you need to develop some godly friends in your life because the Bible says iron sharpens iron. It's how we grow is, is helping hold one another accountable. And then the last one, number four, is kind of a cliche, but Jesus is the best friend that you will ever have. He's the best friend you have if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, he's the best friend that you possibly could have. Uh, and here's what it says in John 15, 13. Here's what Jesus said. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. And I want you to understand that 2,000 years ago, Jesus did that for you. That's why we invited our friends here. We, we didn't invite you. We didn't want anything from you. We wanted to share the greatest thing. L- literally, or I guess figuratively, we were like the, the paralyzed man on the mat. We didn't get healed on our own. We met a guy named Jesus and he changed our life. And we brought you here today because we want you to meet that same Jesus and we want you to know he will change your life for the better. It's, it's, it's not gonna be weird. I know sometimes people think, man, if I become a Christian or if I join a church, it, you know, think I'm not gonna have any fun anymore. I promise you, I have way more fun than I did back when I was partying. And I don't wake up with a hangover or behind bars. You know what I'm saying? Living for Jesus is amazing. And we have a community of people that are doing it together and we're having a great time doing it. So let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. And I wanna say, first of all, to anyone in here who is a Christian, you're saved, you've been born again. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to get your friend to Jesus? Because you have been changed. You've been transformed. You were the paralyzed person in the mat and, and you met Jesus and he changed your life. Can't you share that with somebody? Can't you just invite someone to church? Can't you, you know, in a conversation with someone say, well, just let me, let me just tell you what I believe. I met a man named Jesus and he changed my life. That's what God expects from us. So, so let's do that. People deserve, the people in our community deserve to have a chance to receive Christ the way that you did. And they may reject him. I talk to people all the time. They're like, yeah, I'm not, not ready. Okay. But, but when they are ready, they're going to reach out to us. And that's, that's, that's on them. I mean, that, that's between them and God, but we have to do our part. So Christian, let's do our part and let's do whatever it takes to get them to Jesus. And if you're here this morning, listen, I'm not going to draw this out. I'm just going to give you an opportunity. I, I think back 24 years ago when I was listening to a preacher and, and he told me, no matter what you've done in your life, God would forgive you. And I kind of bristled at that. I laughed. I was like, you don't know everything I've done. And he just was like, God knows everything you've done and he still loves you anyways. And God, no matter what you've done in your life, God would forgive you. And I promise you, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus personally, he hasn't given up on you. God's not mad at you. He's been pursuing you your whole life. He's finally got you here. He's orchestrated all of this and he's got your undivided attention. And he just wants you to know that he loves you more than you can ever imagine. In fact, God loves you so much. This blows my mind, even though I say it every week, but God loves you so much that he gave up his son. He let his son come down here to earth and get beaten and spit on. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they nailed him to a cross and he spilled his blood. He died on the cross and the guy never did not a single thing wrong. He, he died for you and he, did, he died for me. 2,000 years ago when Jesus was hanging on that cross, I promise you, you, your face was on his mind. He was thinking of you. He was picturing you. That's why he stayed on the cross because he could have got down if he wanted to. But he knew that you and I needed a savior. We needed a rescued. And that's what he was doing on that cross was rescuing us. And so with all that knowledge in mind, Are you ready to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Here's how you do it. You just pray a simple prayer and invite Jesus to be your Savior and commit your life to him. It changed my life. And so I've I've vowed that I will always give people a chance to do that, just like someone gave me that chance. And so you're sitting there and God's dealing with your heart. You're white knuckling it right now. I want you to just pray with me. And this is your prayer to give your life to Jesus. You pray it quietly. Just say, dear God, to say, God, right here in this moment, to say, God, I I don't even understand it all, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross in my place. And I believe that Jesus rose from the grave three days later. And I believe that he was my substitute. And it's that Jesus that I receive into my life right now. 
Just tell him, say, God, the best way I know how, I accept Jesus into my life. And I promise you, I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. I won't turn back when things get hard. Lord, I'll follow to the very end. In Jesus' name, amen.